Let's see. All right, I think we're live. Then.
Irish Fibers for this music. It's wonderful. Ah, uh, yeah. Sunday. You know what that means. It means everything's on the table. Spoilers. We're talking uh, theories. We're talking whatever we want to. There are no restrictions. If you're sitting having a couple pints, we are talking, talking tavern. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ryan's brother, Dan. I'm, I'm one half of the way of the leaf. Ryan is not here. Let's everyone just send him and his loved ones just big love right now. Uh, and he will be back as soon as he uh, can. But he won't be here for the show. But it's not just me, guys. It, we, it, we're we here with a couple of special guests. Um, and so let me bring them on. We got Tom, our best friend forever. And we have Gerald L. Coleman, our new best friend. So come on. <laughs> What's happening, fellas? Gerald, I'm so uh, pleased and honored you're here. Thank you. I'm still in Tarvalon. <laughs> yeah, sideways Tarvalon. Yeah. Don't worry, you're I'm gonna, on the good end. I'm on the north end. Giddy. You're going to hit it from the side like a bass drum. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm on the Muppet Show right now. Just <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Come on and play the music. It's time to learn a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fulfilling a <laughs> lifetime ambitious goal to be, you know, on. I feel oh, like I, I'm doing that. Yeah, yeah. Well, you look. know what? I, I'm not it's Kermit the Frog, but we're just hey, as you good. Know what? Let's, yeah! oh, look, hey, guys, guys, look at this place. Let's step in here. <laughs> Tom, worried. what's the name of this place? I don't know. I was a little worried. Scary. Tell, tell me the name of this place. So we can come up with the name. A name? Uh, the Itchy Navel? The Itchy Navel? <laughs> Do you like that? No, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not a fan the, of that one. Okay, uh, no, Meet Tom doesn't like that one either. <laughs> All right, come on. <laughs> tell us what in we entered. We, we entered the uh, Ferocious Feline. It's the the ferocious, ferocious feline. feline. Oh, and what did the sign look like? Uh, like a cat, but he has like an eye patch on, and he's holding a knife. <laughs> <laughs> I like that a little road cat. Yeah. But just, uh, one of his ears is like, oh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's flat, and it's got a chunk missing out of it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. I yeah, I like that. I, I got to make the sign now. Into. This that's going in my next uh, next time I D and D. That's the next time I'm a DM. That's going in. I agree. I agree. That should be. The felt feline? All right, Max Dagger. I see you. <laughs> Gerald, how's your Sunday been? Uh, it's been pretty good. Been pretty good, yeah. I've been uh, uh, looking forward to uh, having this conversation. Looking awesome. swanky, my friend. <laughs> we're, we're here for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, to meet you and welcome you to our show. And also because we do have a contest that is running and we are announcing contest, the winners some, today some kind of contest is yeah there, i think were there, were there we, rewards for it or something yeah we actually do we are the, the winners of both the poetry edition and the short story fan edition uh are getting hard copy ah! of new spring by new robert spring. jordan the prequel they're just out of my reach <laughs> just right over there right, right ah! there. i can't i can't reach right them. there no, just they're, right there. They're they're over there. They're right there. They were they were on the desk when 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 Meet Tom was gonna interview Rafe, but then they were in the way and he threw everything off the desk. But not those books. They were gently placed on the cat tree. That's right there. Well, so good segue, Tom, because you actually did just speak 
to rape Judkins. He did. Not, this guy over what, here. not 48 hours ago. No, it was the, the guy with his hand in my ass. This guy over here. Yeah, that guy. The guy. <laughs> Your proctologist there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and him. He was. Uh, yeah, how was R that? Rafe was super sweet. He's such a nice guy. Seeing him uh, like in interviews and stuff, I was like, man, he seems like a really fun dude. Like, I want to chill with him. And like, <laughs> we talked to him for. You know, like five or six minutes before the show, they were actually at the Wheel of Time cast Christmas party and he like in the UK. So like they they broke away. He broke away to come and sit with us. And, oh, my God. Uh, he was he was just chatting with us while he he also was imbibing uh, judiciously. Uh, and he was just a ton of fun. He was so nice. And he really does seem so grateful of the community, the Wheel of Time community. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, he really is connect as it like is connected to it as you really want him to be like, he, he know, seemed he, like the coolest guy ever. He really was. He was super nice. Either he's a really good actor and I watched him on survivor Guatemala and I don't think he is. Uh, I mean, I love you, Ray. You're an amazing actor. You should be in more stuff. Um, uh, or he's just genuinely a sweet, great guy. And I think that's, I think that's the case. I mean, Gerald, you got a good look, man. I could see you as like uh, an innkeeper in the in the Wheel of Time or something. Yeah. I mean, man, I could <laughs> the vest right there. It looks nice. He'd be a. I, I feel like he he could fit right in, like with a spy master. I I feel like he'd be oh, like Seven Baller or something. He'd be like the spy master. No one would no one would suspect him. He'd fit in at all the royal parties, though. He'd have the best shoes in the house. <laughs> The nicest shoes in the house. And that shit matters. Come it on, does. Guys. Hey, Gerald, so what is your history with science fiction and fantasy and with the Wheel of Time in particular? Uh, well, let me first say, I think that if I had my druthers, I would be um, probably a warder. Mm. To mm. what? To, to, to what? Color, I said, I like. Would you want to uh, be in a library reading books? You want to be out there fighting trolleys? No, probably a blue. Ooh. Probably have to be a blue. Mm. Yeah, yeah, a blue the that's trolley. got her that's got her nose in everybody's business. <laughs> you know, see uh, a spy. He would be a. I told you. I told you. I yeah, knew it. yeah. You called it, it. On. And you know, just so you know, my job would be to make sure that she could extricate her nose and it still be on her face. Perfect. You know, uh, but yeah, I think, I think water would probably be my, uh, my choice. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but it, as to the rest of the question, uh, you know, I have, I have a very, some interesting that I've discovered after um, I really kind of started to get involved in the, uh, the science fiction and fantasy community after writing the, the first book, uh, you know, as, a lot of times as, as writers, new writers, you don't realize that writing the book is just the first part. Uh, that's just, you think, you know, some people might sell you on the idea that once you type the end, then you can, you're good. You can sit mm -hmm. back, but uh, no, actually that's just the beginning of the journey. And I had, I learned that I discovered that. Um, and so, so as I kind of, you know, started to be um, accepted as a guest at conventions, um, a shout out to Jordan Kahn. Jordan Kahn was the very oh. first convention to uh, in, to accept me as a as a guest author. Let's and go. So to me, that that Jordan Kahn is really kind of feels like my home con to me, even though I'm not originally from Atlanta, the Atlanta area. Um, and so uh, as I kind of really kind of got got to meet other. Um, black writers of science fiction and fantasy i really I, I really found out that we had a very many of us had a very kind of similar backstory uh we were generally people who who read all of this stuff growing up you know um for me i i i started uh in elementary school with the with the uh um well loved and remembered uh scholastic book fair who yeah right? Uh, mm -hmm. I was when I would I would save all my money and come into school with my like you know handful of chain pocket full of change right, right. Yeah. and uh, I picked up uh, the first couple of books I got were uh, 
uh, Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim ah, and oh. uh, Watership Down. So those were, I mean, I was already reading comics, you know, reading reading all the usual stuff, X-Men and uh, uh, Thor, uh, Power Man and Iron Fist, you know, nice. the whole the whole list. Uh, but in terms of reading science fiction and fantasy or speculative fiction, as we call it now, uh, th those were the first kind of couple of books that that kind of gave me an, an, uh, an entrance into that world. And then after that, I was reading everything from um, Elric of Melanie Bonet, The Black Company, uh, Dragon Riders of Pern, um, The Lord Black Company, Kings, The Hobbit, you know, all of that. Yeah, Conan. Uh, I was reading all of that stuff. Um, Did you read any I, of the Robert Jordan Conans? No, I hadn't gotten I to I have them. not either. Uh, but then I, I, you know, I found the Wheel of Time. I was, you know, started reading that. And, and uh, how old were you when you picked up the Wheel of Time? Uh, junior high. So oh, wow. 13, I had just read The Lord of the Rings at 12. And then uh, I started shortly after that. Uh, and of course, <laughs> read it for the next. 20 what 23 years 24 yeah, yeah, years yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah. yeah so you know I, the same experience I've, I've run into and in talking to other uh black speculative fiction writers you know we read all of this stuff but we never saw ourselves uh embodied in in any of the characters right we none of the characters looked like us um so i've been writing poetry for decades and so when I, but I always do that at some point I was gonna sit down and write some science fiction and fantasy. And so when I sat down to start writing, I knew I was gonna write, uh, I wanted to write in epic fantasy because as much as I like science fiction and sword and sorcery and all the rest of that, epic fantasy is kind of like my favorite kind of niche uh, genre um, in uh, sub genre, you know, under science fiction and fantasy. And so I started to write my own epic fantasy with a black, protagonists and, and a lot of black characters and other characters of color uh, as a mm -hmm. part of the uh, a part of the cast but um, so yeah that that you know I've kind of discovered that in talking to a lot of other uh, speculative fiction writers that we all kind of had a similar uh, journey to these to the to this point where we are now where many of us are writing this stuff and and many of us started writing this stuff because we love the genre but we didn't really see our, uh, ourselves in it. And so we decided mm -hmm. to kind of write the stories that we would have loved to have uh, been a part of. And then uh, after that, it was a question of, the, back to the beginning of what I said, of learning, writing the end was just the beginning. So I, oh, okay, I need to be involved in kind of the convention circuit. I, you know, I need to be doing podcasts and I need to be doing interviews and all of these mm -hmm. other things that come Wacky puppet that. shows. <laughs> right, yeah, right. Um, it comes along with kind of being in in the community of writers who are writing uh, science fiction and, and fantasy. So you mentioned speculative fiction. Is this encompassing both science fiction and fantasy? Yeah, that's just a kind of a a more ubiquitous phrase uh, because mm -hmm. science fiction and fantasy has become kind of, and it, it, I understand why it happens because it's, it's really a marketing tool. Yeah. to tell people like, hey, this is what this story is about. So that someone who's looking for slipstream or who's looking for um, cyberpunk or who's looking for dystopian science fiction or who's looking for mm -hmm. urban mm -hmm. fantasy, right? You have all of these, you know, 10, 10 20, 30, and 40 different kind of subheadings of science fiction and fantasy. And so just speculative fiction is a more kind of a overarching, more ubiquitous way to say, you know, this is the kind of genre yeah. literature that that we are writing and participating in. So, uh, so I, and I appreciate that a lot. I like that term a great deal. I think speculative fiction, writ, um, yeah, is is it's, a, a it's, large umbrella that can cover all kinds of things. It sounds smarter too. Like when I when I tell people that I read, if they're not nerds, and I say, "Yes, I read speculative fiction," they're like, it sounds, whoa, whoa. It, "They're like, oh, what's that?" I'm like, "Well, actually, I read Twilight last." So you know. <laughs> well, you know that's that. There's that, and it's it's not really a, it, it's really amazing to me. But there's this 
and I don't know how much of it is still prevalent, but there's been this a long-standing kind of um, it, I won't say, disdain is a hard is a is too harsh a word, but there have been people who who are writing in literary fiction, literary fiction, who yeah. kind of you know look down on what we would call genre fiction, yeah, uh, mm-hmm. thinking that it was a um, a lesser art form. Uh, in my opinion, those some of the science fiction and fantasy that I've read. Uh, is some of the best writing oh, yeah. that's going on in literature, period. Um, and I, you know, I've read a lot of stuff in and out of uh, genre fiction, and I and so this notion is somehow or other genre fic, genre fiction is for lesser writers. Mm-hmm. I think is is uh, laughable. Yeah. And uh, we're seeing but, that happen in the movie yeah. industry now with directors talking down on fan, you know, more fantasy and superhero right. movies. It's the same. Right. It's the same old heads trying to like, you know. Well, they're, they're, bothered, they're bothered by the reality that the nerds won. We won. Yep. Yep. We won. Right. D and D is cool. Yeah. The biggest shows on television are fantasy shows. Yeah. yeah. The biggest yeah. movies in, in the theater are fantasy and superhero movies. We win. Yeah, no one, no one is, watch cowboy and I wrote movies. a I wrote I wrote a poem I wrote a poem several years ago uh, that, that talked that touched on the fact that I was a nerd before it was cool, you know yeah. it's cool now, right? You know, with mm-hmm. the, people with their you know with the t-shirts and their chucks, you know, it, it, it's cool now. I I was a nerd long before mm-hmm. it was a cool kind of thing to be, right? Um, I, but I yeah, was a nerd. I was a nerd back when we were dorks. Yep, like late eighties, <laughs> late eighties, early nineties, man. Yeah. Still yeah. Still, so still. it's 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 gratifying at a certain level, but I'm you know I again I think that you, some of did the you play D and D too? Oh man, come on. Yeah, right I at mean, the tail end of the uh, Satanic Panic, so that was a lot of fun. <laughs> that was a lot I of mean, fun. listen, man. I you know Friday nights in high school. Oh my god. I mean. Hours and hours, you know, my mom would order pizza for all of us and we get a bunch of big two liters and we sit around the kitchen table and roll up characters and, you know, we play for hours. I mean, it was, you know, and I thought I, you know, it's interesting how you view things as a kid as opposed to how you look back now as an adult and you see what the adult like your parents were actually thinking. Yeah. Because I thought it was an imposition, like, you know, for mom to have all these kids in the house and we're there till, you know, 12, 1 in the morning, mm-hmm. making all this noise. Mm-hmm. But what I know now as an adult is she was she was she would have been happy for us to do that every every, every night, night, night yeah. because she knew where we were. <laughs> yeah, she, she knew where, where we you were. were. No one was getting in trouble. Right. Yeah. She knew we were we were in the kitchen and that's where we were at one o'clock in the morning on a Friday night or a Saturday night. So she knew where we yep. were. Whereas I was like, oh man, maybe we should wrap it up. She was she was perfectly content to have us, you know, do that for hours on end because we weren't, you know, somewhere out in the street somewhere. We yeah. God knows where, and she didn't know what, where we were or what we were doing. Not so, like my but, mom who would get phone calls in the middle of the night from us playing stickball on the street and breaking someone's car window. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> we we used to carry the balls around with us, but we didn't actually play stickball. We used to pretend lightsaber fight with the sticks. Because we were nerds, but you know we couldn't tell we couldn't tell our dads that we had to like yeah we're playing stickball look see you got the sticks and there's a ball right here and hey man we were totally choreographing uh, lightsaber battles man a stick was always a sword and you know those uh, the tubes from mm-hmm. Christmas wrapping mm-hmm. you know oh, big yeah. long tube that was a sword I mean anything those was, were full contact tubes yeah oh like, yeah you because you can hit people yeah those. oh yeah. Yeah, Erin, yeah. uh, my, my my wife, when we were wrapping presents this year, she took them away from me because I kept picking her with them. <laughs> she, well, she wasn't looking, and I kept picking right. her with them, and then she took them away. Because even now, it's still a sword. It's a sword. Yeah. I mean, come on. Tom, did I'm you a... go... Oh, always. <laughs> All right. is, there, is there any other way? That <laughs> or or I like to say snicker snack and then see who gets it. <laughs> he got it. See, he got it. He got it. Uh... He got it. Uh... Hey, Gerald, what was your first and most recent concerts? My first and most recent concert. Concerts, music concerts. Oh, wow. By the way, uh, Dan, you're just a little bit low. That's probably why. Oh, okay. Yeah, I haven't, man, I haven't been to a, uh, you're talking about live attending a concert? Yeah, they're big music heads. Him and and Ryan are big music heads. No, I haven't been to one in 
in years and years and years. Um, I, I'll give you my highlights, though. Um, I got to see, I was on the fourth row in Lexington, Kentucky to see Whitney Houston. Ooh, um, um, I was in the nosebleed section when Prince came. Sheila mm. E. Um, oh. Sheila E. opened and Prince performed. Um, what, what color suit was he wearing? Was it was it the purple days or the red days? Yellow? Um, um, no, I think it was like white, sparkly. Oh. Was this and Prince of the Revolution? At, at some point, he came out of the top, so he didn't have a shirt on or a top <laughs> on at all. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, probably one of the best concerts uh, I got to see. Uh, I had in, in, in the stadium in Cincinnati, I was on the floor on the fourth row of Public Enemy. Ooh, damn. Ooh. Yeah. I'm jealous. I'm jealous. Yeah. We, and look, we got there a little late because we drove up and trying to get everybody together and in the van and drive up. And, and so we got there a little late. So we missed the opening act. And when we were coming in, um, it was, I got a letter from the government <laughs> the other day. I yeah. opened it and read it. It's, and so we were coming down the steps. Like, oh, nice. I'm rapping along with him because we had, you know, Every time we got to the little checkpoint, they were like, you should, and we're like, boom, we're on the floor, baby. Floor, yeah, let us go. So we all so made our way all the way down, and we got down to the bot to, to the floor level, and everyone was standing on their chairs. You couldn't even sit down because you couldn't see anything. In order oh, for yeah. you to see, you had to stand on your chair too. So I, you know, stood up on my chair and you know, boom, boom, they're going through the thing. Yeah. And um, I'm you know, I'm rapping to, you know. Black Steel in the Hour of Chaos, nice. and Chuck jumps up on the speaker, and he sees me, and I point at him, and he points at me, and we, nice. about three or four, you know, words, yeah. and he jumped nice. off, ran off. I was like, dude, I can go home now. That's it. Nice. I I even, I've won. I don't even need to see the rest of the concert. Mm -hmm. I can go home now. <laughs> I, I I never got to see Public Enemy, but my my uh, my uh, my uncle worked security at Jones Beach Theater on Long Island. It's a famous outdoor amphitheater, and uh, I got to see Slick Rick and uh, oh, Dougie oh. Fresh. Um, the Human Beatbox, Dougie. Fresh? Oh yeah, oh yeah, and and uh, Run DMC. Uh, who else was there? I saw Sublime before the lead singer passed away. Uh, uh, Bradley, but listen, uh, but listen yeah. so the most surreal moment in that concert was, and I guess they did this at every stop, but there was this moment where. Um, Oh, what was the song? What was Flavor Flav? You know, because Flavor Flav always had a song. 911 is Joe Gizur Town. What was Flavor's song? He had what? the get up and get, get, get down. 911 the joke and right, down. Right, right, right. And that so, was like one of his where he was the one who's rapping. He was like, right, oh, right. Uh, yeah. So they did Flavor's song, and then he broke down into the little Flavor dance. Mm -hmm. And all of the lights in the Coliseum went, went down. And they put a spotlight on flavor. <laughs> and you had 25,000 people going, go flavor, go flavor, go. <laughs> and he, you know, he, he doing the little flavor oh, yeah. dance. It was like, I was like, wow, what a head trip that had to be. But uh, so, yeah, that was one of the great concerts. The other one, really great one, and I'll wrap, wrap up my little concert tour. <laughs> no, uh, other, I asked, man. The, the other really great one was when I was at the University of Kentucky, and that was one of the great things about the University of Kentucky because they had a jazz series, and they brought in really great um, jazz artists. I got to see um, Bobby McFerrin in a small, in the uh, the, alumni, the alumni theater. It was a very small, kind of intimate setting. And, and I got to go up and, and talk to him. He met with a group of uh, students before the show. So I got to be in that little group. There was about 15 of us and we met up in the balcony. He came up and sat down and we got to talk to him about you know his thing. And then we got to see the performance. And then um, one really great performance they did at Singletary Center, which is the big kind of formal concert hall on campus. Uh, they brought in, um, uh, Wynton Marsalis when he was directing the Lincoln Center Jazz uh, Orchestra, right? Mm -hmm. When he did that little tour. And to watch, because the way that they did that, he basically taught, like they did a performance, but as they were doing each each piece, he was talking about 
music theory and his history. And so it was kind of like a lecture slash concert. That's and cool. um, I got to see that. I, and, and because we were students, we got really great seats in this. Like it was it was a formal theater, but it's not giant, but it's big enough probably to seat several hundred people. But mm. I had really great seats and we got to meet him after. And it was a great, I mean, performance. Wow. wow. I mean, a great jazz performance. And so so those are some of my like really kind of top, um, you know, the Whitney Houston thing. I went down and camped out overnight. <laughs> you know, out, you can't do that anymore. Oh, yeah. No, you no, like no, out no. overnight like a tower record uh, or at Rupp Arena to get those tickets. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was like, this, I was the second person in line. This is, this is, this is when I learned how, um, how rigged the concert seats were. Cause I was the second person in line and I could only get a fourth row seat. Mm -hmm. I was like, cause I'm thinking I'm gonna get a front row seat, but I was like, oh, okay. That's when I started to figure out, oh, those first few rows are gone even before they opened the thing up for people to oh, buy yeah. tickets, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, man, those are some of my kind of concert, concert highlights. But um, in terms of, I'm still, I'm still, I'm still very much, um, you know, hooked into COVID being a real thing and an ongoing thing. And so mm -hmm. going to a concert is not something I'm comfortable doing. Yeah. Um, and have or have been in there with the bodies the last several mm -hmm. years. Yeah. No, but those are too many bodies too close together. Yeah. Well, let me I mean, jump back enemy, into right man, now. public enemy in the in the Cincinnati oh. Auditorium Coliseum. Man, that was a oh my god, that was a great show. I mean, I was so we were so hyped coming out of that. Like, wow. I saw Public Enemy uh, open for you too, actually. <laughs> really, <laughs> that's cool. Story. Yeah, and I was really close as well, and I was impressed as all heck because they had a drummer up there, and I'm a drummer. So I tend to just focus on musicians. And yeah. I mean, there was a, also I was like at the time I was like, oh, those SRWs or whatever they're called, like the the, the S1, dancers, S1W. S1Ws. I was like, those guys are so awesome and tough. And then like as I get a little older, I'm like, oh, they're just dancers who just <laughs> dress in right. the same uniform. But they're right. just dancers. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but it was awesome. Uh, they put on a show. Flavor Flav uh, is the ultimate hype man. I mean, for real, you're not you're not kidding. He literally is like he, the it ultimate is nonstop. Hype. It's nonstop. Like as soon as they just hit on the stage, they're just stalking the stage like panthers, like yeah. like like wildcat, like just ferocious. You know yeah. that mic is just like an extension of them as they're just kind of growling into it. It's great. I Public Enemy. I I dug a lot. Uh, actually, I saw Rage Against the Machine open for you two too. You two. Was I was I was about to say the only group that I could probably compare them to is Rage Against the Machine, in terms of live, awesome. yeah, live, live performance uh, and the pen, yeah, uh, energy. the energy. Yeah, that's it. Perfect. Yeah. That's exactly what I was thinking. Uh, thank you very much, Matt Stagger. You, your kindness is only surpassed by your goddamn good looks. That's true. Yeah. So let me ask you a question now, Ger uh, Gerald. Uh, so George R. R. Martin, he is described uh, writing in two ways, writing fiction in two ways, either architect or gardener. He, uh, an architect is one who pretty much plans everything out, knows where the bathroom is going, knows where the everything is. And at the end, the house looks like he planned it. A gardener is one who throws seeds into soil and we'll wait a little bit, let it let it cultivate and see what happens in regard to the entire story that is the garden. Is your writing style more architect or gardener? Um, we could say a lot about George, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we won't. Uh, I, uh, look, I think my I think my style is a bit of both. Um, I'm 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 like Jordan in that when I sat down to start writing this uh, epic fantasy series, I knew what the last scene of the series is going to be. Oh. Um, the series is probably going to be five books. You Hopefully, know, you're not like Jordan where you say it's going to be five books and then you're like, oh wait, it's going to be seven. Oh wait, it's going to be twelve. Oh, right, wait, right, it's be right. No, no, no. <laughs> I cannot. I cannot conceive of. 
Because there's other stuff I want to write. I couldn't conceive yeah. of being locked into writing a series for 30 years. I just, you know, I, you know, I can, I can, I can, you know, I can see saying it's going to be five and maybe be six, but that's it. You know, at some point you, you, you know, I kind of know what, what I need to accomplish in each book. So I, I you know, it's not the kind of, a kind of thing where it's just open-ended. Um, but but in the way that Jordan wrote, where where I you know before I sat down and wrote the first word, I knew what the final scene of the entire series is, and so it's me writing toward that, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. so my process is the, is the same at a at a macro level and a micro level, and what I mean by that is I know how the series is going to end, so I'm writing toward that. Every time I sit down to write a one book in the, in the in the series, I know where that book is going to end. I know what the last scene of that book is going to be. Okay. So I'm writing toward that, right? Do you write, I mean, do I know, you have side quests it per se, or is yeah, everything yeah. driving towards that? Yeah, well, both. I have side okay. quests, but every, but the side quests are driving toward the final, you know, the okay. final uh, plot. Right. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And so when I sat down to write each chapter in that book, I know how that chapter is supposed to end. And I write toward that. So that's kind of the extent of my mm -hmm. outlining, if you will. Okay. Uh, but I have I'm always writing notes. I have journals and journals of notes. I've got pictures posted up. I've got maps posted up. I've got, you know, all of that, that kind of world building stuff available. And then I kind of sit down and just write it. So I don't have a, a, a capital letter one, yeah. A, B, C, two, mm -hmm. A, B, C. I don't have an outline like that written out. But what what I do is that in my mind, I sit down and when I'm writing chapter one, I know where chapter one is supposed to end. Mm -hmm. And so I write to that. And then I know where chapter mm -hmm. two is supposed to is supposed to cover. Mm -hmm. So I write to that. Have you and ever I'm had doing all uh, of that because I know how that particular book in the series is supposed to end and I'm writing toward that. Right. So that's kind of my, that's kind of my middle ground between an architect who is planning something out and then a gardener who's kind of in the midst of that kind of, of, uh, of those parameters, then I'm free to kind of let the story do what it's going to do. Have, you ever, yeah. had a, have you ever had a character uh, act up and not do what they're supposed to and like, be like, Oh man, actually, you know, like you be you be surprised on where the direction they're going because the direction you thought you wanted to go is this way, but as you're writing, they end up over here, and you're like, "How did you do this?" I, you know, I had a character that I that was supposed to die in the inciting incident incident in the first book, in the opening of the first book, who decided, "No, I'm not dead," and <laughs> this is how this is how and be, and and became one of the one of the subplots because I have. I have the protagonist who's Bantu and his kind of plot. And then I have uh, about three or four other characters that you follow uh, around also who have subplots. And all of this is leading to the same kind of Bantu's plot, but there's subplots in the kind of the same way that, you know, Jordan has Matt off doing his thing and Perrin off doing his thing. And, uh, you know, the ladies off doing their thing, you know, I, I kind of have that too in the story. Um, and so he became one of those kind of subplots. I'm like, no, dude, you're supposed to be dead. He's like, nope. <laughs> I'm in nope, the back nope. of a I'm in the back of a carriage tied up. Uh, and I don't have my memory. So that's so this is what we're going to do, right? <laughs> so yeah. So yes, yeah, so you you you're always surprised. And it's a it to my mind, it's an it's an indication that you have filled out a character well that they take on their own voice and then you can kind of listen to them and they can kind of guide you in terms of, you know, how they're going to react to certain, you're putting them in certain situations. And then I think what happens is to more, more to the point of, of what you're saying, Tom, I think what happens is you put a character in a certain, in a situation and you think you're writing to something and the character is so well defined that the character's like, no, I wouldn't actually do that. And in the back of your mind, you're like, all right, you really wouldn't do that. You do this mm -hmm. because the character is so well defined that you can then kind of let the character inform kind of what they would do in certain situations. And then you kind of have to figure out how to get them back to 
where you need them to be in, in terms of, okay, but I still need you to get you to, to behave the, and do, the, do what I told mm -hmm. you to do. Damn it. Right. I still need you to do this thing, but we'll, we'll go this way instead of that way. Yeah. I like uh, yeah that's, yeah. that's an interesting take is it, it seeing characters as being, um, I guess things that you have to adapt to instead of them adapting to you as the creator and them uh, showing you the nuance that should occur within their own character. Now, do you think uh, when you advocate for these characters, are you empathizing or are you actually thinking as the character? Wow. I, you know, I think that, look, I think, I think that basically we're all of the characters, the writer, we're, the, 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 we are all of them. We're basically, you know, people talk about, well, one of those characters is you as an insert. No, as the writer, these, these characters are coming out of your conscious mind. So you, you really, it's really you in all of these characters. Mm -hmm. Um, but you've kind of written these these complex characters in a way that it allows you to kind of kind of play out what that would be if you were in that situation and you were that kind of if you were that person. So we, it's basically a, a part of our own conscious uh, minds in all of these characters. But we're writing we're writing them in these particular ways because of of the kind of characteristics that we've built into them. And again, I think if you if you create a character really well, fully fleshed out, vibrant human being, that it becomes much easier for you to, because it's not really, it's not really the character telling you, no, I'm going to go do this. What it is, is the character is so well fleshed out that it becomes clear that a character, that this particular character wouldn't do A, this particular character would do B. Now that may yeah. on the surface play out as as, oh, it seems like this character is telling me what to do. But what it really is, is the work that you put in revealing to you that, no, this character would do this instead of that. If you have some kind of struggle with that, it's probably because you haven't done enough work on the character. And there are a number of people who, particularly when they're writing characters that are, are characters that are outside their own cultural experience, can get into a position where they are writing a, a, a kind of an empty bag, a stereotype, yeah. right? Instead of a fully fleshed out human being. And then you have these problems where you're writing kind of stuff that doesn't make sense logically right. in terms of how a character I, would behave. But I think I what, what, yeah. what that really is when we say, because I hear people talk about that a lot, that, oh, the character is doing what it wants to do. Well, no, what that really means is that you've, you've created a really fully fleshed out character that has clear motivations and you understand what those motivations yeah. are. And so when you write something that is not authentic to that character, then it, you, you're part of your mind is saying to you, no, that's not, that's not correct. We have to go back and, and change mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And mm -hmm. a dangerous thing that you could fall into, like, uh, uh, as you start to flesh out the characters, you said like they're all part of you, is developing a good individual voice for the characters. And from from the books of yours that I've read, honestly, like they don't all read like Gerald. Like as I'm reading it, it's not like, oh, there's Gerald in this character and there's Gerald. Mm -hmm. Like it's a good, you do a good job in differentiating the characters from different voices where some authors are not really good at that. Like, you know, you could, it just, each character, whether they're male, female, young, old, from uh, royals or street rats, they all kind of have the same voice in a, in a, in a sense. And uh, that's- I appreciate that, man. Yeah, I, I no, absolutely. That. I, I, that's why I love your stuff. I, I think for me, it's just having the benefit of having read, you know- So millions, much. Millions of words of, <laughs> of this stuff yeah. that, you know, and being a- and being a consumer of, but you know, also you're a smart and dude. Shows and went to college and movies and all of that. And so for me, I, I think it's very easy for me. <laughs> to to, yeah, he's got he's got he likes to be he likes to be uh, humble, but he's got some he's got some good accreditation yeah, yeah. under his belt. But I, I think it's and I think I've always had a pretty vivid imagine that that kind of helped me develop a pretty vivid imagination. And so yeah. for me. Uh, and because I love the genre so much, uh, it's 
I, I mean, question. I know Epic Fantasy for, forward and backward. Yeah. And so if, if I if I know that I need to have a a wastrel who hangs outside of a tavern and who's a little untrustworthy and you know you can pay him off to do certain things, I know exactly what that character sounds mm -hmm. like. You know, I don't I don't have to go look that up. If it's yeah. a royal who's a little a little bit uh, skeevy who's scheming to kind of take over and, you know, who's doing kind of some underhanded stuff in the background. I kind of know what that character sounds like and kind of what their mannerisms and affectations are because it, and I'll, let me put it this way. I think if you're going to, if you're going to write in any genre, <clears throat> you need to know that genre well enough to know what the rules are and then to be able to know how you can break those rules. Because as a, as a, I'm, I'm not just a writer of this stuff. I'm a, I'm a reader of it. I'm a fan of it. And so if I pick up an epic fantasy, there are certain things I'm expecting you to do, right? There are certain, there are certain uh, notes I'm expecting you to hit. Now, you can do all kinds of creative, original stuff. I'm all for that. But there are certain little kind of touchstones that I want you to, I want you to at least kind of acknowledge and and ride by, right? To because it's an epic fantasy. It's not, it's not sword and sorcery. It's epic yeah, fantasy. It's high more, fantasy. Yeah, it's a little so bit there, more depth. There's some little there. You don't have to. I don't. I don't want. I'm not saying you should. It needs to be cookie cutter. I'm saying that yeah. it has to. It has to be epic fantasy. It can't just be fantasy and you put epic on the front of it. Yeah. As a, as a marketing ploy. No, there are certain kind of. There's a certain kind of. Um, Souchance, yes. <laughs> you know, a certain kind yeah. of a certain kind of taste, the smell, uh, affectation, a certain kind of of uh, tone. Mm -hmm. uh, they're little touchstones that I want you to hit. And now, outside of that, do all kinds of, of original stuff. I'm yeah. all for it. I think, but, and I think that's one of the reasons why science fiction and fantasy is alive and well right now, because you have a lot of writers from other cultures who are bringing what they can uniquely bring to the genre. And I, I think that's what has made it uh, as enlivened as it is right now. So I'm all for all of that. I'm just saying that if you're writing science, if you're writing classic science fiction, you know, there are certain little notes that you, you need to hit yeah. for me to, to know that that's what that is. If you're writing, um, if you're writing urban fantasy, right there, there's a, certain kind of tone I'm looking for, right? Yeah, yeah. Um just like if I if I turn on the TV and I and you you tell me this is a this is a classic British murder mystery, right? You can't it can't be in Los Angeles. Yeah. You know, it can't be in Los Angeles with a with a PI who lives over a a coffee shop and drives a 67 Mustang, right? That's a different genre. Yeah. Right? It's, you know, it's got to be something. You, you, so, yes, you can be original and all that. Now, I'm, I'm all for that. But then I want a couple of little touchstones for you to hit. Yeah. So for me, like, I come to Epic Fantasy with all of that, you know, uh, mm -hmm. understanding of what the genre is kind of in my DNA because I've been reading it since I was eight or nine years old. So a lot of this stuff is, for me, it doesn't take a lot of extra steps because I, I kind of have a feel for Okay, this is what this character I want this character to do. And 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 then I know how to then take that and again put my original kind of take on it. Yeah. Uh I think I have some really interesting villains that have uh, that that kind of kind of they kind of pay pay homage to kind of the classical powerful villains of the genre but that have you know my kind of take on that yeah and, and they have a little bit of depth too one. like it's not just like you don't just hate them right off the bat you know what I mean? like it's, <laughs> yeah. it's like it's not like oh i hate this guy i hope he loses like you know it's, it's well let me let me ask you gerald so how do you do uh, i i was i haven't read one of your books yet and i will correct this error in my life soon <laughs> but uh i did uh look at some um like previews and whatnot just doing a little research you write um your character names are cool 
Uh, they are classic fantasy awesome names. <laughs> and I noticed the land name had a couple uh, apostrophes that were floating around. So how do you come up with the names? Can you pronounce every name you've ever created? And what is the weirdest name you have ever put to print? Oh, wow. Um, I, you know, I, I have had, I've had that part A of that question asked a lot and people are astonished. Like, how do you come up? And again, I think it's just a question of, of having, you know, having put all of this, you know, decades of reading Epic Fantasy into my personal computer that when it's time for me to think up a name, uh, well, let me, well, let me put this in two different camps. Um, when, when I'm creating the names for uh, what those people who have read any of the three, uh, the three gift series will know as Alakaz, right? That that's the kind of across the ocean where uh, black folks are, who's Bantu, who's the main character, is his homeland. Um, those are, a lot of those are actual African names that I then kind of, add to my kind of epic fantasy kind of twist and world building um, because his people, um, for example, his name is Osasande Bantu A apostrophe Omerede, right? That's his whole name. And as a part of world building, you have Omerede, which is the great house that he's from, which is okay. his great house name. Uh, ah, the the ah, there are ah apostrophes and as apostrophes, and those indicate that they are the firstborn of their house. Okay. Bantu is the end name that is spoken by the people in his house. Osasande is the name that's the out name that is spoken by people outside of his house, but from his homeland. So he has four, he has three names and uh, and an indicator. Uh, and you see that throughout uh, all of the great houses in Alakaz, right? So that's kind of some of the world building. So like Bantu is a is a group of languages in Africa. So I took that as a kind of a um, to make him a kind of every man African character. Oh, okay, right? that's cool. There are characters like Jamila, and there are other names that are actually African names. Like some of those names that are spoken. Uh, either inside the great house or outside the great house are actually African names that I use. And do then there the are names, names, do the names, are names that I make up. Do the names dictate the character or do the character dictate the name? No. Um, generally, no. Not sometimes you, you, sometimes you'll have a character that, excuse me, you know, serves a particular purpose in the story. And you'll take uh -huh. a you'll take that word and play with it to create a name, you know. Mm -hmm. People do that a lot, so that can happen sometimes. But then sometimes it's just a question of, for again, for me, it it, it I you know I know that my subconscious is doing certain work, and so for me it's a feeling that once I create a name, does that feel right for this character? Mm -hmm. And I and I I know enough of kind of cognitive science to know that. That's my subconscious working at a level that's telling me, okay, yes, this functions in the ways that you want it to function for the mm -hmm. character. And so I have a feeling that, okay, yes, this is a good, a good name for this character. Right. Um, right. And then there are characters that, you know, I, uh, okay, this is a heroic character. So I, I, in, in epic fantasy, heroic characters' names are kind of like this, right? Yeah. And I come yeah, up with yeah, this yeah. name. And then this is a villain. So, uh, 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 well, here's another example. There are two groups that are that are basically magic users uh, in the, there are a number of different kinds of magic users in the story, but there are two kind of, two kind of, of, of groups that are, are probably kind of like Jedi slash Aes Sedai slash wizard uh, characters, right? And the good guys are called Kagadi. And the bad guys are called Sakari. And um, the the Kagadi all have names that end in 
Stormbreaker or uh, Lightbringer or, you know, those kind of names. And mm -hmm. the bad guys have names like that, but they are, they're names that are like Demon Guard that are kind of like, yeah. that have a, 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 yeah. kind of an evil kind of bent to them, right? Mm -hmm. So those are very kind of conscious choices in terms of names. Uh, <clears throat> so, I, you know, again, they're, they're creating names kind of function on several different levels for me. Like there's sometimes where I'm really kind of consciously doing something that means something very particular. And then there are other times where I think I'm doing something that is a, that is just a question of my subconscious working on what I understand as the kind of the bedrock of ep epic fantasy. And I'm creating a name for a character that I know is, 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 is situated in a particular way in the story. And so I create a name and sometimes it's like, ah, that doesn't kind of feel right. And I throw that away and, and work on it and create something. And then something comes, I'm like, yeah, that works. Now mm -hmm. I can't always, in those instances, I can't always say, okay, this works because of A, B, C, D, E, F, G. But I know consciously what's happening is that my kind of, of, my kind of catalog of epic fantasy in my mind is working on that at a subconscious level, which, you know, I, you know, I, if there are any writers who are watching this, I know they have the same experience where you'll be working on something in the world building or in the story. And then you kind of like, okay, let me just kind of give that a while to simmer in the back of my mind. And you may go a week or two and you'll be doing something mindless and your subconscious will say, Ding. Okay, I'm done working on that yeah. and drop it in your conscious mind. You're like, ah, that's it. You gotta run and write it down. So kind of uh, trust yourself. That, yeah, that but that's yeah. that's actually that's your mind working on the problem in the background. Yeah. That's you just not you just not making it up and pulling it out of the air. It may not be conscious, you may not be sitting there consciously working on it, but yeah. your subconscious is working on the problem. That's cool. mm -hmm. I I I I got to know because it was part it was uh, part of Brother Dan's question, but I got to know now. Uh, like, so do you have maybe not like I don't exactly like a made up name because like it, you, most of your stuff is like an amalgamation. But is that who's the cat? Do you have a character with like the biggest mouthful, like the biggest name that's like ha -ha, this is going to be funny? To try to <laughs> I can't wait to hear someone try to pronounce. Yeah, this it's now. just <laughs> it's just a big middle finger to the audiobook readers, <laughs> right? No. No, I don't think I, I've done that, you know, consciously. I haven't kind of said, oh, I'm going to mess with somebody. No, nah, um, no, nah, but like, you know, who's got the who's got the um, biggest name, biggest mouthful? I think that I think that I think the biggest is probably. Um, a, a place in Alakaz called Cal Ala Abasa. OK. <laughs> you know, it's got it's got. There's a lot of A's in it. Yeah. There's a lot of A's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let, yeah. And, and, and let me say this, uh, 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 cause I, and Tom knows this, but I just wanted to, for anybody who wants to say, oh, let me run out and check out Gerald's work. Um, certainly check out the, the new short story collection that I just put out from Earth, from Earth to Sky. But if you're interested in the epic fantasy stuff that we're talking about right now, um, and I know this is going to sound crazy because people are like, what? You don't ever say that. But I'm going to say it. Uh, wait for a moment. Um, wait, wait, take a beat. Because, and I'll tell you why. Because I am actually doing a, I'm almost finished with a, a rewrite of the first book. Now, the plot hasn't changed. It's the exact same story. Anyone who has, who has bought the book before doesn't need to go buy the new book. The same stuff happens. I've just been working. I'm a better writer now than I was six, seven years ago when I first started writing it. And so what I've done is just gone back and kind of brought the writing up to where I am as a writer. I right can't wait now. to read that version. I'm going to read it. Um, and, and, um, and so, again, so the, the same stuff is happening. You're not missing out on anything on the plot. If you were to pick up, because after I finished this, I'm, this is book one I'm almost finished with. And then I'm going to do the same thing with book two. And then I'm going to work on book three. And because book I'm working on book three right now to come out. And so if you waited to pick up book three, uh, you wouldn't, you're not going to miss anything. There's not yeah. going to be anything, you know, I'm not dropping anything different in terms of the plot into these books. Uh, but it's just for anyone who 
who hasn't picked them up yet, who are who is interested, wait a moment. Um, you know, so For probably to the, by, to, to the sky though. That's that stuff is the yeah, short stories. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's ready to go. Collection of short stories that just came out. You can pick that up. But if you're interested in the epic fantasy series, I would say just wait a moment because I'm almost finished with book rewriting book one, and that'll come out uh, hopefully before Jordan Khan. And then I'm going to work on do the same thing to book two, and then I'll start on book three. So that's what's coming for that. So I mean, you know, you can feel free to go and pick it up. I'm just saying, I think I I would rather you um, wait for a moment so that you can get. Because the thing that I discovered is, as I was working on book three, I was like, wow, I'm such a better writer than I was 10 years ago, right? And it would be a shame if, uh, and I know there are a lot of people who, are, who have enjoyed book one and book two, but it would be a shame if someone was reading book one and it was just kind of wasn't quite their thing yet. And they didn't, they, I'm like, so they're not going to get mm -hmm. to book three. If they don't finish book one, they're not going to buy book two, and they're certainly not going to get to book three. So for me, it was instead of having this, you know, much better writing in book three than I did in book one, I said, well, let me just do this. Let me go back and kind of do a new edit of book one and bring it up to where I feel like my my level of writing is right now. And then I'll mm -hmm. do the same thing with book two. And then as book three, I get to work on it. I don't feel like I've left anything on the table. Right. Um, right. Right. So I would say, you know, just give me a few months if you're interested in the fantasy series. I know there's some writers out there that are going, no, don't <laughs> tell people not to buy your book. That's hypothetical. Nah. But I want them to get the best experience. This is, mm -hmm. and I say that because this is the series that I mean, I'm right. I've written a bunch of short stories. I've been in a bunch of anthologies. I have this new short story collection now. I'm working on another science fiction novel. But the fantasy series for me is the book is the series that I have been waiting since I was 16 to write. It's the it's kind of like if there was one series that I a one set of books that I would want to leave after I'm gone, it would be this. Uh, right? Okay. Even if yeah. even if you burnt up all the other stuff and nobody ever got to read it, I would want this to kind of survive and to be kind of the the center of the legacy of whatever I, I leave as a writer. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. I want it to be the best that I can um, that I can kind of put out there. And I always say to other writers, listen, you, you know, your the thing that you are critical of in your own writing is not that your writing isn't great. It pro there are a lot of people who probably really like your writing. What's going on is your taste. You have taste. Your reader's taste is here. Yeah. And you think that your writing is here. And that's the kind of disparity that you're feeling. It isn't that your right. book isn't great. It's that your own internal kind of taste is such that you don't feel like your own writing yeah. is rising to the level of your taste as a reader. Mm -hmm. Right. We're all that, our own really worst critics. So. Right. Um, and and for a novelist, the hardest two words to type is the end. You know. Definitely. Definitely. I'm going to try to do it, though, because there's other stuff I want to write. There's a lot, <laughs> a lot of other stuff. And that's the other reason why I cannot foresee writing tw uh, 12, 13, 14 book series because there's right. other stuff I want to write. There are new ideas coming all the time. I've got mm -hmm. ideas of books that I want to get to written down. And I, you know, so I want to have this series done so then I can move on to writing other stuff. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so hopefully the rewrite of book one, which is called When Night Falls, uh, will be finished March, I'm hoping, because okay. I want mm -hmm. it to be available at Jordan Con with the other stuff that I'm going to bring to sell. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I'm going to, you know, kind of spend the next several months uh, doing the same thing with the plague of shadows, which is book two. And then I can go on and, and, and finish writing uh, book three, which is called when chaos reigns. Right. And then there, there'll probably be, I'm hoping given where I think chaos reigns is going to end. Cause again, I generally know where, I, where I want books to end before I start writing them. I'm 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 fairly certain that there'll just be two more. That it'll be five, a total of five books in the series. Uh, and so then I can again, so I can then go on and, and write other stuff. Because there's a great, there's a great science fiction story that I'm working on that's kind of like a a mix between um Jody Whitaker's Doctor, um Ray in Star Wars and Shuri in Black Panther. It's a female kind Count of me in. 
kind of warrior and she's got uh she's got seven mothers and she's growing up on this deserted planet they're hiding her and so that's kind of the beginning of it that's where it starts Ooh. and then you got to figure out well why are they hiding her and what's you know uh, so this you know it's it's so there's other spoiler. stuff i could tell you're passionate about it you're just like i just want to talk about it. i want to yeah, tell you like, what yeah, happens yeah, yeah, so, yeah. see so that's what i'm saying so there, yeah. there's other stuff that i want to get to uh, i just want to kind of make sure that this is this because the epic series is, is really close to my heart so i just yeah. really want to make sure that it's it's the best that it could be and then i can kind of you know leave it out there and and, and let folks enjoy it or not yeah, I well, could Jared, totally, I could totally fear your enthusiasm for that. Like, I could let's totally commit do it. now that once the book one is republished or revised, that you will be back on our show. Yay! You will have an announcement, and and we will revisit this. Uh, and I'd be glad to be happy to. Yeah, and yeah. talk about the the whole process of rewriting your own work yeah, and not being be... satisfied and saying shit, man. I can do better, you yeah. know. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Tom, I, I respect Tom, that I, the first time I told Tom, he was like, well, what do you mean? So I sent him a little snippet. I was like, OK, here's 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 the section from the original. And yeah. here's what it looks like now, just to kind of give him a little yeah. taste of what it what that means, which is, you know, if you guys want to do that when I come back, I, I can have a couple of. of I mean, it's just examples. it's interesting seeing the 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 process, you know, like, yeah. you know, I'm not a writer in any way, but like it's just it's fun listening to nerds nerd out about things they nerd about. You know what I mean? Even if it's not the, the, the stuff, like the actual story, like what's in it and the lore, it's just the, the actual process of putting it together as like right. a, as a project is interesting. You know? Right. Sure. And also the, the maturity in deconstructing your own art. That's, uh, yeah, that's, you know, that's, I mean, you got to have a strong, you know, yeah, like, it, like like will to be able to be to, to, to sit there and do that, you know, like you know, it, I, well, it's, okay. it's that old, it's that old, um, it's that old cliche of killing your darlings, yeah, yeah, yeah. right, yeah. So, so uh, Ger Gerald, if I can, before we get to the, the competition, the winner, yeah. there is one thing I did want to comment on. You have, uh, you, you mentioned before earlier that you did not find a uh, great representation in science fiction or fantasy for black uh, youths. Um, uh, if more than 30 years ago, you uh, were part of this movement, uh, a co-founder of the, uh, even because even Appalachia did not include black Americans in the definition. So right. you uh, are part of this movement that uh, has redefined, uh, has, has adopted after, Afrolatia is that the yeah. way to pronounce it? The yeah. Afrolatia poets. Yeah. Um, in Kentucky, you were in a uh, Go Wildcats, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so I kind of want to know what gains you have seen in the thirty years, and what do you see in the future for fantasy and science fiction in regards to representation for um, those of us that are not white cis males uh, you okay. know lgbtq yeah. women minorities right. uh, what what do you what do you see the direction going right okay so just uh, let me just clean something up real quick okay Please. so because you'll have some people on here who are watching from uh appalachia oh, okay okay in, thank you the, in kentucky so you in kentucky you're either saying appalachia or if you're because i came up saying appalachia because i'm from lexington right and so Lexington is, without any judgment, just because of the basic kind of, is a college town. You've got the University of Kentucky, you've got Transylvania, you know, and so it's 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 uh it's it's a little more urban than the rest of Kentucky, right? Not a lot. It's still Kentucky, but a little, but a little <laughs> bit. So anyway, I grew up saying Appalachia, but most people will want to say, oh no, it's Appalachia, right? And so some of those people will pronounce it Afrolatia, right? Okay. Okay, that's fine. To me, it's tomato tomato. That's yeah, just but that's me personally. Now there are those some people who that's a hill they will die on. No, it's Appalachia, so you gotta say Appalachia. <laughs> and that, okay, hey, God bless you. Go in peace, and the God of peace go with you. you know, just, <laughs> do you? Do you? You do you. Let me do me, but you you do you. Yeah. Uh, so I've always said uh, Appalachian, right? 
<clears throat> but just quickly, um, the term Afrolatia was coined by one of our co-founders, Frank X. Walker, who's a fellow poet and co-founder of, of the group. And, uh, you know, we both went to a, 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 a reading at the Lexington Opera House that was billed Ooh. as, I want to say it was something to the effect of the great, of, of the great writers in Kentucky, something like that, right? Some ubiquitous title like that. <laughs> so <clears throat> I went because I was in a one of my poetry workshops that I was in that was run by George Ellen Lyon, really big name in Kentucky and outside of Kentucky as a poet. George Ellen is a great poet. Um, uh, said that we should go. So I went. Turns out Frank had gone. He was there. And <clears throat> so we sat there and, and listened to this presentation. People bring them bring out writer after writer to do their reading. And after it was over, <clears throat> Frank and I were standing in the back of the opera house and we both kind of looked at each other and said, you know, did you notice? And I was like, yeah, did you notice? I'm like, yeah. So we were kind of noticing the same thing that there were no black writers on that stage. Now, Nikki Finney was there and Nikki Finney is also connected to the Af Afro-Latian poets. I love Nikki. Mm -hmm. I've known Nikki and Nikki's an, a phenomenal poet and teacher. Uh, but Nikki's originally from, from South Carolina. Nikki's not originally from Kentucky, but they had her on mm -hmm. as kind of a guest as a part of this group. So there were no indigenous Kentucky black writers on that stage. They were all white with the exception of Nikki, who's from South Carolina. And so Frank and I were both like, wait a minute, you couldn't find one black writer from Kentucky, not, not one great black writer from Kentucky to be on that stage, but all those other people. So shortly after that, Frank, we had been sharing poetry with one another because Frank was the first uh, other black. I know at least I... one great, great Kentuckian poet. <laughs> so Frank was, the, when I first got to the University <laughs> of Kentucky, Frank was like the first like other black guy that I ever met who wrote poetry. I thought I was by myself. Uh, and so that was, I was, that's how our, that was our kind of first connection. I was like, wow, you write poetry. He's like, you write poetry. So we would share poetry with each other. That grew into us sharing with other, other black writers who were sharing. And that's kind of the quick story of how we became the Afro-Latian poets. But Frank coined the term. He came back and said, oh, okay, how about Afro-Latia, right? So he took African, he took Appalachian, Appalachian. It's beautiful. And and he put those two words together and uh, and it became a, a, the Oxford English Dictionary picked it up and Ooh. created it. It became an official. What? Yeah, it became. You can look it up in the OED. OED not, baby. What they used to say, <laughs> knock it up in the OED. And it's in there. And so it became an, an, a, it became an official word, right? You, coined, you, was, you, were, you were part of coining a whole word. That's what <laughs> Holy that's cow. Cool. That, that's well, so that, awesome. uh, we give all that credit to Frank because Frank thought yeah, that up. But, and, and created that on his own. But then we adopted the word as a part of our kind of nascent poetry group. And so that's 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 how that kind of you know um was created. Um so so yeah, it was an attempt to kind of address that kind of that vacuum. It's like, hey, we're poets, we're gonna claim this this space as our own, we're gonna claim the word poet for ourselves, and this is who we are, and we're poets from Appalachia, and we're black poets. From Appalachian, so that's how that that kind of that well, kind of came and, out. And y'all, y'all didn't that. just step on a pedestal. Y'all created the pedestal to walk on. I mean, it's so impressive to me. The the this whole movement, like the the idea of like why are uh, Black Americans not being represented by this term that we all use for all of us? Yeah, for and everyone yet, that's from this area. Except and for yet, these yeah. people that are from this area. <laughs> and yeah. Yet, yeah. 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 And just, you know, for those of you who are interested, if you go on to my site, geraldcoman.com, go to the blog, just add coffee. There is a beginner's mm -hmm. guide to the afro yes. poets. That is a whole list of books by uh, those, uh, all of those, uh, my fellow afro You can find mm -hmm. those and pick those up. There's a lot of great stuff in there, yeah. stuff from Frank and everybody else. So, just an opportunity of anyone who's interested in reading, reading more about that. But to get back to your 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 other question, I you know it's that it's that tension between it's always that tension between yes things have gotten a little better, but things need to get a whole lot more better. Oh, yeah. And it goes back to that thing that James Baldwin was was 
always say, the, the quote from James Bond where he's like, you all keep asking for more time. You took, you've used up, mm -hmm. you've used my up time. My, my time, my, my father's time, time. Yep. my children's time, mm -hmm. you know, my nieces and nephews time, you know, how much time do you need? Right. Yeah, right. So, right. so things have gotten a little better. Uh, I was, I, 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 the show, the peripheral, on Amazon Prime, I think was a good is a good example of having some decent black characters, having black characters, and then having black characters who are actually full fledged human beings who aren't just there to serve, uh, to serve to kind of further the plot of the white character. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I think there's some other shows that fail miserably at that. Sam, Sam man, is maybe one, one of those. Man. <laughs> Hey, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I, you know, folks, you say, say it with your chest, right? So I'm going to yeah, say it with yeah, my yeah. chest. Sandman, yeah. I think, came up short. I think yeah. Neil, I, and I, you know, I don't have anything against Neil. I yeah. think Matt Neil. Matt Stagger's on um, top of that, sharing all the links. Yeah. Sharing oh, the, thank you, sir. Your, to, to, your, to your Patreon. Down there. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank I you, think that, I think Neil's, I think Neil's, uh, Neil had a, uh, his heart's in the right place. Um, I think, but I think two things can, can operate at the same time. I think you can cheer on Neil for taking on all of the trolls on, on social media and doing yeah. that effectively and well. And I think at the same time you can say, eh, yeah, but you could have done better or they could have done better with the black characters in that show. Because, yeah. you know, the thing that disappoint, I, I love the world building in Sandman. I think the production value was on, was top notch. I think it was beautifully shot. Uh, but I think that, when all of your char black characters are servants, right, or yeah, yeah. cannon fodder, yeah. or die to motivate or evil. white characters, or evil, or, right, or yeah. evil, uh, or just show up to emotionally support the white character. I know there was. I think that I think the actress that played Death did a wonderful job. I'm glad she got the job. Yeah. I think the writing failed her. And yes, that mm -hmm. folks were saying, well. There's a short there. There's a, a short series of just her character that's really great. Okay, go shoot that, right? Go film that. But yeah, that's not me. that's not in the show. And what's yeah. in the show is that she only shows up to emotionally support Morpheus. Yeah, he's ha he's down. So her, her character comes along, pats him on the back. Come on, you get up, get up. You can do it. You know, I'm here yep. for you. Yeah, right? Yeah, we yeah. have we have millions of black characters that that that's their role. So she comes off as as that magical Negro trope. Yeah. Um. So I was disappointed in that, and I think I think uh, I think if it was the '90s, I think we would have accepted that because we would have been like, "Oh, look, mm -hmm. black people on screen." Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and right. that that was right. a step in the right direction. But we're it's 2022 now, so it, it can't just be black characters on screen. We've gone through 75 years of of film and TV where black people have been portrayed terribly. Yeah. We've been been portrayed horribly, and I'm interested in or seeing, you know by white people. Yeah, I'm interested <laughs> in seeing. I'm interested in seeing some positive, uh, uh, a representation of black characters like like in Black Panther. I need to see more of that. Yeah, and less of you know the servant who's walking around behind Morpheus with a clipboard. You know. Answering his every whim, right? Yeah, right. Marvel's uh, doing a decent job, I think, uh, with right. the, with their later movies. The later yeah. movies. So, so I think we've come. I think we've come a long way, but I think we still we've got a lot of work to do. There's a lot of stuff that 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 can be done, that should be done, and I think part of it. If if let me let me stop by saying let me end by saying this that the thing that made Black Panther so great is that it was created by a black creative. Right. Ryan Coogler, the director, oh, amazing, you know, did a He wrote it. He did a great mm. job directing it. It's a it's a film that not only stars black characters in front of the screen, it has black creatives behind the screen who are yeah. the ones mm. who are doing the writing, who are creating the costumes, who yeah. are doing the music. So I think the more that we have black creatives to come in and participate in the creative mm. process, then the the more we'll have that kind of representation that we're all yeah. interested in and looking for. So we need more more black TV directors, more yeah. black TV writers, and, you and know, more black creatives in front and I, behind yes. the camera. In, in that yeah. vein, I saw a great interview actually. Uh, who just to build off what you're saying um, with uh, I forgot it was a I forgot what movie it was for. It was a while ago, 
it was a Denzel movie. I can't remember who else was on stage. I could see it in my head, but someone asked like, because it, the, the movie that he was doing was done by a black director. And then all the people on the stage were like, yeah, you know, that was great. But, and the, the interviewer said, you know, why is that important? And Denzel said, well, he took a second and he goes, okay. Um, Spielberg directed Schindler's list and Scorsese directed the Godfather. Yeah. Do I think, uh, um, Spielberg could have directed The Godfather and it'd been a great movie. Yes. Do I think Scorsese could have directed Schindler's List and it would have been a great movie? Yes. But there are cultural nuances mm -hmm. that you just right. don't understand mm -hmm. unless right. you're part of that community. Exactly. And I think exactly. he used I think the, the the reference that he used uh, for, for for the black director and the black community because it was a it was a modern film about a family. I can't remember. fences. Yes, that's, uh, yes, that's what it was. Okay, yeah, thank you because that was gonna bother the shit out of me. Okay, so uh, he was like, uh, the the reference, the example that he used is like, he's like, if you're black, you know what the smell of a hot comb through your hair smells like on a Saturday morning when your mom's brushing your hair. He's, do I think Spielberg could have written this movie and directed it, and it would have been a fantastic movie? Yes, but there are just cultural nuances yeah. that you need to be black yeah. to understand. Well, yeah. and Tom, and I, and, keep, and that's, I keep saying, okay. uh, I'm sorry, Dan, I keep saying that, um, you know, J.J. Abrams probably could have done a passable Black Panther. It yeah. just wouldn't have been the movie that we saw. It wouldn't yeah. have been anywhere close to the movie that we saw. And I think it would have probably ended up more around the budget of the uh, box office range of like the first um, the first Doctor Strange rather than yeah. being mm -hmm. one of the biggest blockbusters Ever. You know, in the entire MCU, right? In the it's entire just, history of movies, yes. Right. It's just, you, you just, it's just, and and again, this listen, I, this goes to writing too. I'm not saying that <clears throat> that white writers writing speculative fiction can't write black characters. I think you should you should be writing, you should be stretching yourself to try and write characters outside your cultural experience. You just got to do the homework, right? You do yeah. that, but yeah. so that's okay, and that's a perfect, that's where the voice comes good. in. Yeah, See, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel acceptable. comfortable writing a black main character because I don't think that I have the qualifications to really right. do so. Right. I, it's not that I don't want to. It's right. that I don't feel it's right that I, I – who yeah. the fuck am I, more or less? That, that... Listen, let me put it this way, Dan. I think that – I think that – I think that – I think the point from from the perspective of black creatives is, listen, people can write whatever they want to write. As long as they do the homework and do it well, great. What we're yeah. also interested in at the same time is not only that kind of representation, but we're also interested in um, publishers signing black authors to write those stories, yes. too. Yeah. Right. Yes. Not not either or both. Right. Yeah. You can write whatever you want to write. Do the homework. Write it well. Okay, we're gonna applaud that, but at the same time, we also want, you know, the the broader publishing community to say, hey, we're way behind on publishing black writers to write these stories yeah. instead of simply because what what some of them were doing like a decade ago was, oh, people want more diverse characters. Well, let's hire the same white writers to write these diverse stories. That that's what they right. were doing a decade ago, right? right. And yeah. so. Okay, that's that's fine for you to have that happen if people do their homework and write fully fledged characters who yeah. are have their own agency and all the rest of that. But the other thing that we want to see is black creatives, black writers have that opportunity to write those mm -hmm. stories. You want a story set in Africa? Hire a black writer to do that. You want yeah. a story set in uh, in South America? You know, hire a South American writer to do that. You want a story mm -hmm. set in in Japan, ancient Japan? Hire a Japanese writer to write that. We're out there, right? Hire those right. people too, right? And so right. it's not an either or. It's it's both. That's what we yeah. want. Mm. Yeah, the, uh, that's a really good point. Before we before we jump into the um, uh, the winners of the thing, I uh, Matt Stagger uh, uh, in chat asked a pretty interesting question that I want to know the answer to now. Yeah, um, let me. Uh, I'd start it here. It is this one here. Yeah. yeah. So he asked, is it a different mindset you need to be in to switch to poetry from fantasy? Ah, so po great, poetry great is hyper-realist and, and fantasy is not, I guess. Great question. Great question. Um, it's yes and no. 
I know that's not as uh, <laughs> a tidy an answer. What? As it's a complicated um, answer. Who would have thought? Right. <laughs> what? Well, I mean, it, look if you if you've read. For those people who have read the, the epic fantasy books one and two so far, yep. they know that there are chapters that begin with the poem, mm -hmm. right? I use that as part of my world building. Uh, the chapters open with quotes, but there's also sometimes a poem or a, um, it's one, I, I use those, I use quotes. There may be a recipe. Yeah. There may be um, an old saying. In there. Yeah. there may be a it may be a poem. So I use those to kind of flesh out the world building to lead into each chapter. And they and what they're, they're there and they have something to do with what's happening yeah. in the chapter. Every right? single there's, one of them has agency to the chapter. Yeah. Right. There's a yeah. wink and a nod toward what's coming in the chapter. Mm -hmm. So, but those is those are, that's spec. Even the poems are kind of speculative fiction poems. Um, so that's. I think it's I, I think it's the genre for me that's different. So that when I when I'm writing, for example, the most recent poetry collection that I put out is called On the Black Hand Side. I loved it. And that's and that's about you know, it was fantastic. That, yeah, basically that's about black life, black love, um, uh, and justice, right? Yeah. Social justice. Yes. And so yes, I have to be in a different headspace to write that because it's a, it's a different genre. But if I'm writing speculative fiction, like if I'm working on a novel and I need a poem for this chapter and the poem is speculative fiction, that's coming from kind of the same general place. Ah, okay. Does that make sense? So it's yeah. the genre more than, than the art form. Like I can write a recipe that's speculative fiction, right? Like how would a, rec <laughs> how would a, how would a recipe be written in this speculative fiction world? How would this nuggets. Poem Right. How would this poem be written in this speculative fiction yeah. world? Which is so that's one thing. And then if I'm writing about because the the on the black hand side is poems and micro essays. Yeah, I was going to say there, there's there's little bit little bits about Gerald's life in there, too. So if right. you want to read about young Gerald, baby Gerald getting in trouble with his mom. Little Gerito. Uh, yeah, little, just a little bit of your baby <laughs> Gerald just in there getting in trouble, scaring the <laughs> shit out of his mom because he gets hurt. And, uh, with an honor pop. Uh, 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 <laughs> when he discovered comic books and books and stuff, it's, it's, uh, I love those bits. Those yeah. are the bits yeah, I was like texting Gerald. I was like, ah, ah, I love this shit. Like, this is great. I love. So this yeah, shit. so that's that's me taking that kind of my own life and kind of writing using poetry and micro essays to basically kind of say, hey, my I'm a black man in America and my life matters just like every other life matters, right? Black yeah. lives matter is basically the the statement, but I'm using my own life and the artifice of poetry and micro essays to kind of make that point using my experiences and history and, you know, other stuff. So yeah. it's a different, yes, it's a very different headspace when I'm doing that as opposed to when I'm writing um, science fiction and fantasy. And really for me, it's, that's a, that's a benefit because oftentimes uh, writing one, is working a different mental muscle. So it gives me a break from writing the other, huh. right? So it's kind of like, a, instead of taking a break and doing absolutely nothing, I can take a break from science fiction and fantasy by writing poetry. <laughs> now you and sound like Brandon Sanderson. Break, yeah, I can break, take a break from poetry and write science fiction and fantasy because they're kind of working different, different creative muscles. Oh. Um, so yeah, it, yeah. It, it does take being in a kind of a different headspace, uh, but it's because of the content, not so much the form. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. All right, All right Tom, so you want to you want to do the winners? Yeah, if you can get yeah, if you can get the winners going, I'll ask Gerald a couple rapid fire questions. Uh, Gerald, yes or no? Lasagna. Yes. Uh, cats or dogs? Neither. Spring or autumn? Oh, autumn. Red wine or white? Red. Um, I found them. I found them. Okay. <laughs> I was looking. Uh, I had to find them. There were there was a lot of stuff on the desk. Okay. Bass or guitar? Guitar. Okay. Uh, um, suede or leather? Depends on what he's wearing. Depends on what his belt is. Sweater leather. 
<laughs> Sweater leather. He won't Sweet. Be I, I give him All a right. lot. I give him a lot of shit about about his fashion, but I, he's de- like 100. I'm jealous. That's what it is. It's just <laughs> it's just that I'm jealous that he has a far better fashion sense and a much deeper closet than I do. This Gerald, man, mustaches, yes or no? Just a mustache? No. You got to have a beard. Okay. Uh, All right. Uh, acceptable. That was acceptable. I, think, I got a little I worried there for a second. Uh, Gerald, that's roofs. Yes or no? Say that again. Thatched roofs. That uh, thatch thatch thatch. Oh, roof. thatch roof. Oh, yeah. yeah uh, yes or no? No. Okay. That's some nonsense okay. right there. That's some. Okay. Like, listen. And have is... you ever had a honey cake? No. Okay. You mean like a honey bun? Like uh, it's something you would call a honey cake? No. Okay. Okay. Have you ever seen a palace in real life? Like Caesars? No, no, not Caesars. Like where a royal lives. No, but there's a funk. There's this funky little castle on the road from Lexington to, well, in Kentucky they say Versailles, but it's actually supposed to be Versailles. Versailles yeah. But there's a castle. It's <laughs> actually a there's a literal castle out there. I think Lee Majors used to own it. Ooh. Hey, hey, uh, Gerald. I live in Detroit. There's a place near here called M I L A N. People call it my land. I'm like, it's Milan. It's yeah. It's Milan. Yeah. It's what literally Milan. Yeah. My land. Yeah. <laughs> listen, listen. If you're in Kentucky, you say, "Can you tell me how to get to Versailles?" They will. What? What? Is, what are you talking about? <laughs> listen, listen. They say, my, listen. They say Versailles. It's Versailles. Yeah. Versailles. Versailles. Yeah. Versailles. Yeah. And you're like. It's for Sai. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hey, okay. Okay. You, you're, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. You're not wrong, Matt Stagger. I don't think I don't have the I don't have the sw- I don't have the, the, the swag to pull that off. Like he, he's got the swagger, it? man. Like I, I I don't got it. I just don't got oh, it. Oh no, yeah. I do have several hats that are like his though. They're, yeah. Oh, there you go. There you go, Dan. Go. Yes, sir. <laughs> the uh we're, we're we're both uh, selling newspapers on the corner in the 30s. <laughs> That's we're, your both hand, in the li- we're both in the little rascals. Extra, extra. <laughs> pinky, pinky blinders. Yes! We're both pinky blinders. Great yeah. show. Great show. Thomas Shelby. Okay. Do, do you want to? Do, do you want me to announce both the winners? Do yeah, do I don't have them in front of me. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. 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 All right. So we had our little uh, our little contest here, where we had we had a decent amount of submissions, and there were there were some great stories. A couple of those stories that when I was reading them, I was like, man, I want to know what ha- I want to know more. Like, I want to keep reading. Right. This. this is interesting. Right. I, I was like, this is pretty cool. Like, I, w- I want to explore this world a little bit more. Like, you know, most of them were Wheel of Time themes. So it was like, you know, I want to go. I want to see where this goes. But the effort uh, and creativity was uh, next level. I was oh, yeah. Really just, just great. Yeah. I, I, I am not an avid po- poetry reader, which was, you know like for th- uh, 60% of the reason why we harangued Gerald into doing this also, because you know, he's, <laughs> yeah. a, he's a professional, he's a professional out there, poetry, poetry man. But, uh, uh, I, I enjoyed the, the, the poems too. Definitely a hundred percent. There was a lot of great, uh, uh, there were three in particular really liked me, but I don't want to, I don't want to rain on no one's parade. I don't want to ru- munch on anyone's bunch of crunch. So, but the the, the, the it no, was a munch, tough show. Munch their bunch of crunch. Oh yeah, maybe later after dark show. Well, <laughs> I need consent. I need consent. It was he asked the consent before I munch on anything. I hear but, you. I hear you. But uh, the um the the it was a tough choice, and I'm glad we gave the final choice to Gerald because then we didn't have to make it. Uh, Not our fault. Yep. But the the we have two winners <laughs> now who are going to be getting um hardback copies of the uh, new spring novel from uh, which we're currently reading on the Tuesday show. Come and check it out. 10 o'clock um, that uh, uh, one for the poems and one for the short stories. So without any further ado or nonsense, we have Kevin a Davis with uh, arrow. Uh, what was it? Uh, the arrow had flown. Yeah. The arrow had flown. But, but, flown. but Gerald had, Gerald had a suggestion for, for, for a name change for that. The what arrow. was it? The arrow. Yeah, the arrow. I, I think he should just call it the, the arrow. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. it is a great, that is that, that like, that. it's clean. It's clean. 
and then the for for the poet and and we will get these posted online so that we will get them posted on the website or, or we'll post links to them on uh, we'll host them somewhere so they look all pretty. I do uh, I do have the both of them here. If you wanted to, me to read like a, uh, a couple paragraphs of the poem is flown. I or the arrow, <laughs> the poem. Well, 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 we'll, we'll let we'll let people read the whole thing. Maybe we, maybe we'll do a recording. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll do that. We'll let chat tell us. Chat, if you, okay. would you like to hear us do like a recording? Maybe we'll get we'll get Gerald. Maybe Gerald, you you read the poem and and then yeah, we'll yeah. we'll take different characters voice from the story. Voice we'll actor voice extraordinary. Yeah. 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 But uh, anyway, so so the poem is by Tyler Richardson, and it is called Reborn. It was, uh, it was a, a really good poem. I, I, I yeah. very much so enjoyed it. It is, uh, uh, it, but for, for those, obviously, I feel like most of the real-time fans will understand who this poem may focus on slightly. It's, it is a poem about, kind of about Rand and the dragon and, and, and that kind of stuff, but it's, it's a really interesting poem. So every, anyway, anyone, congratulations <laughs> if they're here watching. Uh, Great job, guys, and great job to everybody um, who 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 submitted. And you know, having the just just submitting is to submitting work for others to read. That's that's a it's a tough thing, especially if it's not something you do on a regular basis. So really, just kudos to everybody for for really right. not, willing to put it, that out there. Not anyone, not everyone could have won, but I I was really impressed with uh, pretty much all of your guys' stuff. I I was fired up to get each submission. And we're going to try to do something like this again um, and keep going, man. You guys, yeah. you guys are all creative, wonderful, lovable people. I mean, exactly. I, I love. I don't know about Matt Stagger. That Matt Stagger guy is a little sus. Yes, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I, man, I wanted his poem. I liked his poem. A yeah, lot. he was, he was in our choice too. It was, it was in our I tops. Got, yeah, yeah, he was in the top three. The, so the, yeah, it was. The 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 we we will collect information from those who've won, and we will get your books out just as soon as I get off my ass and mail them. <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm just I'll just be dead ass serious. As soon as soon as soon as I get your information, and then you know, work up the will to leave the house. Can can I ask uh, Tom how many copies do you have? Uh, I have uh, I had. We, we brought uh, we we gave them away at Jordan Con for the most part, and then I was left with like thirty of them, and I gave most of them to local libraries. And I actually drove around to like, the, you know, those like little library things that people make where they put like they look like little houses. So I put some of them in there, but I have three left, and one of them is going to be uh, uh, probably hey, another. No, I think I, I I had a tough time choosing uh, between. Ooh, okay. The poems, I think. I think judge's Matt, Choice, Judge's Choice I, Award. I think oh, Matt Matt Dagger should get a, a, a Judge's Choice Award. Oh, Matt. oh my! Matt, you're getting the book, Matt. And guess what? I have Matt Dagger's address already because he won a book. He he won a prize on the trivia contest a couple weeks ago. Oh. Hello. Matt okay, Jagger gets so, a bonus so, Bella. Okay, so here's my question. Can I do a Judge's Choice Award in the prose, in the short story? I only have oh. one more book. I don't have two. <laughs> you know what? I'll buy Tom, I'll Yes, buy yes, we can get book. another one. Yes, yes, I'll yes. Judge's Choice for book. the story, too. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes. so Judge's Choice for the story is the um, um, the one in the, in the ways. What's the title? Yes, I love that one. That was... Uh, Oh, uh, hold on! I got it. In front. I got the 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 thing in front of me. Uh, where is it? Watch me. Watch yeah, it was me. watch me. Watch, watch me. me. Yes. yes. Watch me by. That was by Michael Cummings. Michael Cummings. Yes. Yes. I loved that one. That's the that one that I was like, was I want to keep good. reading this. What happens to the ways? What's happening? Yeah. I want to read it. That's the one I was reading, and I was like, I just want to keep reading it. I just want to. Oh my gosh, Michael. Hello. Just... Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Judge's like... choice. Judge's yes. choice award. Judge's... Gerald breaking rules. We love it. I love it. 
Thank you, man. Thank you so much for doing this. And thank everyone for, for, for submitting. Y'all are fantastic humans. And yeah, you good. I can't wait for you to get your books. Thank you guys yeah. for asking me. This has been a blast. Always, always man. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, Gerald, hopefully this is the beginning of a long friendship for all of us. Yeah, well, um, the hat's gone. Right. <laughs> I'd be glad to, I'd be glad I can't to come see. back anytime. I had, I had a really great time tonight. Woohoo! It's Thank a blast. you very much. And yeah, we uh, we we love talking this stuff, and we and we're hoping to do a couple more contests and stuff. So Iris has uh, it right. Yeah, hopefully he can be our. Gerald like, has never met a rule that he hasn't wanted. Or he broke. can be our Simon Cowell. <laughs> our, our Simon you can Cowell. be our celebrity judge. Celebrity <laughs> judge. Yeah, you just gotta bring you gotta bring him you gotta bring him the good drinks. That's it. You just gotta bring him the good drinks and a nice cigar. Yes, and. Are you going to uh, JordanCon? Oh yeah, this year. I will be there. This man. Oh man! All right. Well, I can't wait. To dress, dress meet. like, like. I'm a hugger, in... Gerald. Just so you know. <laughs> dress to the nines every night. <laughs> I'm a big, tall hugger. <laughs> His brother's right, even guys, taller. Guess... His brother's like six seven. You you gotta watch yeah, out. Brother, that man yeah. is a large man. <laughs> All right. Yeah, he, but I mean, he's a he's but, a kind of Dan here is the man. He's a yeah. cuddly little bear. Oh, yeah, Dan is the man. It's true. Yeah. Da, da, da. <laughs> All right. Guys, this has been uh, Tavern Talk. Uh, join Tom and I with our brother Ryan and our first time reader, Josh. This Tuesday, we'll be talking uh, chapters 6 through 10 yep. of New Spring. Uh, we're already be like a third of the way done, Tom, of that book. It's a I tiny know. little book. It is. It's a little baby book, we're, but it's fun. We're rocking it. So, uh, until next time, everyone, be good humans. We love you. We're proud of you. And uh, link arms and get punched because that is the way of the leaf. Water cloaker. <laughs>